Good morning. Um, I'm actually thrilled to be here. Um, this is a beautiful place, exciting place, lots of good energy. Um, I have no uh, pharmacological or uh, device company disclosures to make for the presentation I'm going to do today, but I do have some disclosures in that I'm, I just realized I've become the mother of <laughs> a grown man, and I, I'm, I'm also, uh, I guess uh, there's another person here in the crowd that uh, came from our training program and is at LSU, Brian Copeland, he's sitting in the back. Um, and both uh, Dr. Kader and Dr. Copeland have actually contributed to this presentation because I forced them to work in you know, the, uh, some of the uh, research that we were doing as they were training as fellows at uh, UT Houston. So I changed the, the title of this because I realized that um, I needed to tell a story and where we were coming from, and uh, it's better suited if I called this the neuroinflammatory process in Parkinson's degeneration. I'm also just delighted that the preceding talks were outstanding and I get to build upon them. Um, and so I might reiterate a few things, but I will try to emphasize um, the neuroinflammatory process that we think is going on and how uh, we're focusing in on what that actually means and maybe even turning this uh, disease around. So um, just a quick overview. Is there any way I can make this big? Just one second, please. <laughs> is there a full screen phenomenon? No, that's okay. No, okay. Um, just a brief over overview, I think uh, Parkinsonism has already been well defined. When I talk about Parkinson's degeneration, I'm going to take the liberty of trying to broaden the understanding of the degeneration can lend itself to the fact that there are other alpha-synucleinopathies, that protein that was discussed. There are other disorders where that protein is a major factor in damage to the nervous system. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about neuroinflammation and try to define um, the fact that the microglia are activated in Parkinsonism and Parkinson's degeneration. And we're going to get our evidence from the fact that I've, in my career, I've collaborated with great scientists, researchers, uh, basic scientists, clinicians, investigators in all sorts of departments, pathology, immunology. We've built stories on cell cultures and then animal models and it's given us information that we use and proceeded to go ahead and and build clinical trials with uh, individuals that have these disorders and try to find quite most recently try to find biomarkers for the disease process um, so my clinical trials are advertised at, in the NIH and uh, the Michael J Fox and PD clinical trials etc most of the information that we have on the inflammatory process in Parkinson's disease and the mechanisms have really emphasized a single point in time where a lot of information is, got, is obtained rather on an individual that may be suffering from Parkinson's disease or another form of um, Lewy body disease where you find out uh, fantastic images of what's going on in the brain, the activity of the brain, um, the activity in the substantia nigra, as you've heard, uh, striatal nigral system, etc. What's going on in the cerebral spinal fluid, the fluid that the brain and the spinal cord lives in, what's going on in the blood, etc. So these are big biomarker studies that are going on. Uh, you probably know that there's a huge one about olfactory loss and looking at people to see what that means and where they're going to go from that. The study I'm going to emphasize today is actually a longitudinal study where about five years ago we enrolled individuals into a what's called a prospective longitudinal observational study where we looked at, neuro, at uh, neuroimaging, we uh, rated individuals with the uh, universally ap applied ways of rating Parkinson's disease. We did uh, quality of life surveys. We did some cerebral spinal fluid analysis. We also took blood and uh, rated their olfactory system, all this information. And that's actually, in the last year, we have some very interesting information about the longitudinality of 
the immune system and immune profiling individuals that have both Parkinson's disease and a uh, variation on a theme, people that have uh, atypical Parkinson's disease. We've also done something where we've looked before the disease really um, is manifested or even diagnosed. We've looked at what's called the prodromal or the premotor state of the disease and tried to identify um, predictors of the disease by looking at these same measures. So fortunately, I do not have to redefine where we are. I think we have a good understanding. For the most part, our understanding really is, uh, reflects the idiopathic or late onset Parkinson's disease, and we know it's a slow, slowly progressive disease. What you should also understand is that it's a chronic disease. It can affect an individual over their lifespan for a good 40 years. It's probably one of the slowest of the neurodegenerative diseases that I'm actually aware of. Um, and the majority of, idiop of Parkinson's disease is actually considered not uh, genetic in nature, so we call it sporadic. Um, the clinical diagnosis is based on the motor expression of the disease, and that's a point in time when the striatal nigral system is affected. Many of the non-motor symptoms that were talked about by Dr. Deutsch, et cetera, um, actually Dr. Deutsch, um, actually many of them actually precede the onset of the motor symptoms. And currently there's no real biomarker or uh, for both the disease state, identifying it, or actually following it over time, see how it changes. You've already seen this, the whole idea of alpha-synuclein being a protein, and when it's conformationally changed, it actually can clump and aggregate, and downstream from that whole process, the cell tries to protect itself and make a Lewy body. So this is what's called the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease or Lewy body uh, pathology. This is also seen in other Parkinsonian-like disorders. Uh, Haiku Brock, this is just staging to, to reemphasize the fact that this disorder, again, a 40-year uh, lifespan um, affecting an individual over their lifespan for 40 years. And the whole idea is that there is a pattern that's predictable in idiopathic Parkinson's disease um, where selective areas of the brain are affected. And as they're affected, the areas that are affected get, actually get worse over time. The severity increases. But there's this concept of, of progression. And some of the most uh, interesting phenomena uh, has been uh, figuring out why it progresses, what makes it progress, et cetera. If we're going to pick, I'm going to pick on alpha-synuclein right now, um, talk about a little bit about its function and its toxicity um, and linking it to the inflammatory uh, response. So it's quite an abundant protein. It represents about 1% of all cytosolic proteins. Um, it's considered a presynaptic, so the front part of the synapse neuronal protein. It is the uh, protein that's recognized in uh, many Lewy body uh, diseases, PD for one, uh, diffuse Lewy body disease, which is quite different. All the diseases that have different names have, mean they have a different natural history associated with them. And then there's one called multiple system atrophy, which is very, very much like Parkinson's disease, except it has a much r faster rate of progression. What we do know is that when alpha-synuclein misbehaves, it misbehaves because its conformation changes. And when that happens, it disrupts cell homeostasis, okay? We also know that it can form little fibrils and create pores in cells. Most recent evidence actually shows that it also is involved in levels of, of dopamine um, transmission, that it uh, can also seed and aggre uh, it, the aggregated um, alpha-synuclein can seed neighboring cells, and that might be key to its uh, propagation. This is a, a little cartoon that, that sort of describes what I just talked about, um, the fact that in, native, uh, in a native state, it's a 
it's a, uh, it's a curly sort of uh, entity, and when it changes, it becomes a fibril. And the fibrils are actually the toxic species in alpha-synuclein. And uh, we heard the words Lewy neurites um, and Lewy bodies in neurons. We actually think that the uh, proto-fibril or the oligomeric soluble portion of this uh, alpha-synuclein is, can trigger all sorts of uh, oxidative stress in the environment and actually is probably the cause of um, activating glial cells and glial cells can release uh, cytokines or inflammatory mediators. Now it's true that we really do not know the pathoetiology of Parkinson's disease. In other words, what really makes the alpha-synuclein go bad? Uh, it remains elusive. Um, it's probably a multifactorial phenomenon, um, susceptibility of neurons and cell types, et cetera, susceptibility of an individual's immune uh, profile and ability. But we do know for about two and a half decades now that, uh, that, in, that activated microglia are part of the whole process in Parkinson's disease and that there's uh, an inflammatory response, pro-inflammatory cytokines are released by activated, activated microglia. And then there's post-mortem studies that show that not only are there increased um, expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines in glial cells, but there's a reduction in glial cells as well and that there's re uh, a decrease in um, growth factors that maintain the environment of the neuron and glia um, and the homeostasis of the whole area that's being um, in affected by uh, in the Parkinson's disease process. Now, I've jumped from neurons to the immune system, and I should clarify something. It's hard enough to talk about the immune system and the nervous system, but the immune system is a little bit complicated. So just briefly, I want to tell you what's a microglia. Microglia are actually the, the resident uh, defense cells in the brain. So when there is injury or insult, if, if an individual has a stroke or some kind of exposed to some infection or toxin, microglia react. They can be phagocytic. They can eat up. They're, they're also the cleanup crew. They can eat up debris that will harm the environment of the neuron and glia. They themselves can release um, cytokines. Cytokines are small molecules that, are, that um, can do all sorts of things. They can trigger downstream st stream responses. They're actually neuroprotective initially, and they're quite important to maintaining and protecting the brain. You know that they're actually in the periphery in the blood. They, they come from the same line of cell monocytes that are in the bloodstream. It's the same kind of precursor cell that you see in the brain. The microglia in the brain actually are very, very long-lived, though, and they're relatively dormant until they get activated. Um, we do know that over the course of Parkinson's disease, there's actually a overproduction of uh, cytokines, a pro-inflammatory response to the extent that it gets toxic. There's an overproduction of what's called oxygen, reactive oxygen species. Um, we also know that there's a parallel recruitment of the immune response in the periphery. When I say periphery, I mean in the bloodstream, I mean in the bone marrow, in the spleen, okay? And many, many investigators think that if we capture that, if we understand that parallel recruitment, maybe we can use it to uh, further protect the brain from degenerative process mediated by toxic, a, a toxic inflammatory response. So let's put the neuroinflammatory process and alpha-synuclein together in Parkinson's degeneration. Well, there's a theory of propagation that the extrusion of alpha-synuclein um, via, it's a non-classical secretory pathway. Alpha-synuclein is supposed to do its thing and stay in the cell. When it gets altered, it actually elongates and can leave the cell and actually be extruded. And it can, um, as a changed protein. Um, and then it also 
can uh, seed adjacent cells. It's called the oligo oligomeric aggregated alpha-synuclein. It can be taken up by adjacent cells. And this is the theory of propagation and how it's actually spread. We also know that extracellular alpha-synuclein induces an inflammatory res uh, reaction in neighboring glial cells. So this is a rendering of what I just talked about. Uh, the evidence for neuroinflammation in Parkinson's disease, where this little uh, green entity would be alpha-synuclein released from a neuronal cell or dopamine neuron cell, which uh, activates microglia, causes phagocytosis, all that is good. It's actually a beneficial response. But something gets awry, it continues to happen, and actually there's more activation of uh, glial cells that in turn release cytokines that have all sorts of funny names about them. Um, these are interleukins um, that, have, that induce a specific response. Um, and then glial cells and microglia, more uh, cytokine release. And this is pretty much what's called um, the innate response of taking care of an injury. Later on, there's something called um, an adaptive immune response that the immune system has both globally, systemically, and in the brain. The adaptive immune response is a little bit different. It is uh, humoral and mediated by um, antibodies. So a model of development of adaptive immune profile, again, this is a cartoon where you have alpha-synuclein and microglia um, releasing inflammatory cytokines that ultimately influence what's called a T cell, which is a uh, regulatory cell, a lymphocyte, that can take different pathways. And the reason I'm showing you this is because for a long period of time, we used to think that Parkinson's disease was predominantly, in, insofar as the adaptive immune system is concerned, that it was influenced by um, cell-mediated immunity, which is Th1 and specific cytokines are associated with the Th1 response. And these, this is a, a response that just kills the, the, uh, the culprit, kills the, the um, pathology that's going on in the immune system. Uh, a Th17 response is related to interleukin-17 and others. This is a response that you see in autoimmunity. So it's a response that you see robustly in arthritis or in um, other autoimmune diseases, um, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. But you also see this. This is the Th2 response. And Th2, for the most part, wasn't considered actually a, par a process of Parkinson's disease. But this is the antibody-mediated immunity. And very specific cytokines are associated with the Th2 antibody immunity, um, specifically IL-4, 5, and um, IL-13. And this is just a little cartoon of the antibody response attacking, presumably, alpha-synuclein as, as if it was the antigen. Okay. So what's the significance of cytokine reaction? Well, it indicates activation of of glial cells. So you have a disease process where we know that the brain is reacting. Um, there's an inflammatory process going on. There's local secretion observed in brains of Parkinson's disease patients. Um, this, is, this secretion is also found in cerebral spinal fluid, and we've contributed to some studies looking at that. There's also some evidence for increase in inflammatory cytokines in the peripheral blood of Parkinson's disease patients. And that's what I'm going to show you today, where we have longitudinal data that, that actually defines the immune response in the process. And the type of cytokine profile expressed indicates the type of immune response going on. This is critical information if you're going to turn around and make it work for you and figure out why there is a degenerative process and why the brain actually fails to continue to protect itself. Um, and then there's a question always, is cytokine secretion over time predictive or indicative of disease progression? We'll try to show some things. Um, just to give you a break to not look at all my wordy slides, which I apologize for, but this comes from 
cultured cells where you can see that um, uh, rat, uh, no, actually these are human-derived uh, glial cells where alpha-synuclein is actually cytoplasmic and red and hanging out around the nucleus, which is blue. You stimulate with a cytokine tumor necrosis factor, and what happens, alpha-synuclein becomes aggregated, it increases, and it redistributes itself. So that sort of makes you think, well, you wonder if the inflammatory process actually initiates the whole progression and of Parkinson's disease. There are a number of animal models in Parkinson's disease, and animal models are very, very critical. They give us information that we uh, wouldn't have otherwise. One of the most um, interesting animal models is using an endotoxin called lipopolysaccharide. And in a rat animal model, you can actually um, induce an infectious-like process, process with lipopolysaccharide and find that it it reproduces actually a Parkinson's disease-like picture in the rat. And what you find from this information is that areas that we know are affected in um, individuals, human beings with Parkinson's disease, actually have the same, can have similar effects going on in the rat brain. There are vulnerable areas, areas in vulnerable cells. This is olfactory bulbs showing increase in tau, another protein and alpha-synuclein after LPS treatment. This slide is just to emphasize the fact that um, uh, how things get into the brain could be that they cross the blood-brain barrier, or if that's difficult, they can actually get in through the brain through the bloodstream, and so you have the green thing here is highlighting a, a vessel in the brain that it's surrounded by lymphocytes and IL-6, and there's co-localization of lymphocytes in IL-6. I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and skip through this and just bring us back down to Parkinson's disease. I told you it was a 40-year disease. This is the spectrum. You can, um, neuroanatomically, you can find out what's affected and, and how it's expressed clinically. Um, the prodrome or the premotor phenomenon is considered a 20 year, po possibly 20 years um, before onset of the motor symptoms. This is I the ideal time to intervene with the disorder, um, the non-motor symptoms. So um, the challenge is to identify uh, what to intervene with and how to intervene. So what we did is we measured plasma cytokines in Parkinson's disease. We compared it to age match controls and also a group of individuals that had atypical Parkinson's disease, specifically multiple system atrophy. And then later on in these slides, I'm going to show you how we also focused in on the prodromal or the REM sleep behavior disorder group of individuals who are at high risk for developing Parkinson's disease. We analyzed the immune profile of our individuals by using a uh, bioassay that is uh, called a millipore multiplex map human cytokine chemokine panel. And um, it's a very sensitive, specific panel. Um, and these are some of the results, specifically and early on. Again, we had multiple time points to look at. Um, and we were comparing with age match controls, but also with people with atypical Parkinson's disease, trying to find a pattern that, uh, of what's going on with um, the immune system. And we found some really interesting stuff. We actually found that there was a distinctly different patterns between Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy and controls. Um, these are actually uh, all this data is taken over three to five years on individuals that participated in this longitudinal study. Um, and the pattern here is quite distinct besides being red, white, and blue. Um, Parkinson's disease is represented in red. And as you can see that the cytokines that I've listed here, the, the, prominently these are either cytokines that are involved actually in that Th2 response that I talked about, the antibody-mediated response, 
and or there are some markers here that I haven't talked about, IL-12P40, funny names, who, that are representative of just a chronic inflammatory process going on. Um, and that a continued activation of microglial cells are going on when you see some of these cytokines being so high compared to uh, controls and actually even multiple system atrophy. We also found, this is just an example of, uh, some of the people that participated in our trial where we really found that the levels were very consistent and stable over time. So this is most, this is a three year period of time where multiple samples are taken. It means the response is fairly stable over the time frame that we looked at um, individuals. In this slide, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that you're gonna get more for your buck if you can intervene before you get motor symptoms. If we can find a way to retard the um, deleterious activation or inflammatory response in the brain by, um, by manipulating the immune system before the motor symptoms really take hold, then we'll be better off at uh, retarding the progression of the disease. So we would like to pick on this prodromal area, this premotor area, and one really reliable way of doing that is identifying individuals that have what's called REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, over 60% of individuals with what's called idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a sleep pathology related to REM sleep where an individual acts out their dreams, 60% of these individuals um, actually go on to develop uh, Parkinson's degeneration. Now the majority of them can develop multiple system atrophy and or Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's a powerful group of individuals that are at high risk and so we've chosen to study them. And when we did that, we actually had um, some interesting results. We found an increase in inflammatory cytokines in the plasma of REM sleep behavior disorder patients and in Parkinson's disease patients. So if you think about the timeline, a person with REM sleep behavior disorder, premotor, comparing it to Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot of, of the same things that are happening in Parkinson's disease are actually happening earlier in the REM sleep behavior disorder group. This graph is a little bit deceptive because you have to read the um, y-axis to understand that it's a fold change. The, the changes were so different compared to controls that we actually needed to present it this way. So this is a fold change, like a two, three, four, five degree increase in cytokines in the plasma of individuals in these two groups compared to um, controls. And again, we see a pattern that is quite interesting. It's a pattern that looks like um, the adaptive immune system is really cranked up. There's a lot of stimulation for uh, a chronic, of a chronic inflammatory nature. Again, I broke it down in a little simpler form. Um, there's an increase in the TH2 associated, but not the TH1 or TH17 um, cytokines in the plasma of both the RBD group and the Parkinson's disease patients. As you can see, IL-4 is a large marker for TH2, as is IL-13, and on either side of that, interferon gamma and uh, IL-17 are um, not that impressive. There's also an increase in um, late and chronic inflammatory cytokines in the plasma of the Parkinson's disease patients, and to some extent, the uh, RBD patients. Again, this is just another way of looking at it, but with the different cytokines. Now, well, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and why isn't the immune system protecting the brain? Well, it's, this is a chronic inflammatory uh, disorder. It's different from an acute injury. Um, we, we get that. We also found that uh, 
there are changes with duration of disease. The x-axis on this is a description of the duration of disease, so that's in years, uh, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, and 10 to 15. And this is averaging all the information we have on the TH2 associated cytokine levels. And um, what we see here is that these cytokines are increased around the time that the diagnosis is made and then five years and then there starts to be a decrease in uh, the cytokine levels. So there's a dropping off of this immune response over time. This comes from another study that we did where we looked at actually at uh, alpha-synuclein in the plasma. We, we could look at it at the CSF, but this was easier to do. Um, where we actually also saw that uh, IgG-labeled uh, alpha-synuclein um, that was in the plasma also drops off over time insofar as the duration of disease. Um, so that means there's a connection there with alpha-synuclein and the inflammatory response. This is just another uh, graph that, t that shows duration of disease and the robust response of pro-inflammatory cytokines and then the long-term chronic inflammatory cytokines um, that we know enhance phagocytic activity and how they're dramatically increased and then they just drop off as the disease progresses. We also know that um, we did some correlations with behavioral measures that increased cytokines correlate with higher UPDRS scores actually in the REM sleep behavior disorder group. This is a group of individuals that do not, that are asymptomatic, they have not been diagnosed with either Parkinson's disease or an atypical Parkinson's disease. We still look at them and rate them with the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And as they change over time, actually their cytokines are increasing and that's actually positively correlated with an increase in their uh, rating scale, which might mean that, you know, this pattern might be able to predict the onset of uh, uh, Parkinson's degeneration. Okay, you can also look at quality of life. We've also, so we have uh, the Parkinson's disease quality of life scale. There's a, a, um, a correlation between cytokines, both Th2 and Th1 suppressing cytokines um, with better quality of life uh, scores or surveys. And this was in Parkinson's disease. So. A lot of graphs, a lot of pretty pictures, but I hope I explained what we saw here, and that is, and we have to take in mind that these are observational studies, um, but they actually show distinct serum cytokine profiles and associations with uh, disease duration and symptomatology. They may prove to actually reflect the mechanisms of degeneration or the failure of the immune system to protect the brain. They also could just represent biomarkers, a disease state, and may have nothing to do with progression. But we find that it's quite promising um, in that it gives us a field uh, to understand that maybe we can manipulate the response in the brain by uh, understanding this mechanism and um, um, using a person's own stem cells from their bone marrow to uh, reinvigorate the immune response and to retard the progression of the disease. And basically, this is the last slide that I wanted to talk about. Um, that would be a very powerful way to um, turn things around for Parkinson's degeneration. Uh, this slide actually sort of sums it up in a cartoony sort of way, um, looking at microglia as referee between neuronal processes and peripheral immunity um, and how it can be manipulated. Now, these authors actually took the stance that it was the, um, that the most toxic aspect of everything was in the Th1 response and that if you really wanted to help the brain out, you would uh, induce or the uh, 
TH2 response. But in our studies, longitudinally, what we're finding is that the TH2 adaptive immunity response is actually very, very robust. The problem is that it obviously is dying out with, uh, um, with the progression of the disease and associated with the duration of um, disease. Now, I know that was just a little snippet of um, some of our research and what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, uh, I'm done. <laughs>